Hello, I'm Tony DiMaria from UC San Diego, and at the moment I'm in San Francisco at the TCT meeting where there have continued to be a number of really interesting clinical trials and new developments. And what we're going to do to focus on the entire program is uh, in this session and the one to follow, we're going to talk about the highlights of the TCT through the entire week. And to do this with me, I have Deepak Bhatt and I have Jeff Popna, who are both professors at Harvard University, and very proud of that, obviously. Uh, so Jeff, the SAFE PCI trial was uh, kind of interesting, wasn't it? It was, it was a phenomenal trial for, for a number of different reasons. One is that it's a new concept. And the concept is to perform a randomized trial in the middle of a registry. So the CAF PCI registry was used to identify um, a, a group of patients, women specifically, randomized to a radial or femoral access. Uh, the, the, the requisite elements within the database were used for most of the demographic variables, and then specific outcome variables were constructed that related to the trial itself. Now, uh, unfortunately, the trial was negative. Uh, question that was being asked was, is there a benefit with respect to bleeding, um, bleeding events uh, with, uh, in women, radial versus femoral, but there were some trends in those patients uh, who had diagnostic cath and less so with those women who underwent PCI. But the structure of it, I think, was, was a phenomenal piece. If we could move towards randomized clinical trials that perform in structured databases, it allows us to ask many, many more scientific questions at a much reduced price. I think the total budget for the trial was $5 million. Yeah, yeah. there's no question that this is the future. And Scandinavia is leading the way. And yeah. of course, it's a lot easier for them because everyone in their country is insured by the government and all their medical records are available. But nevertheless, starting with that, they're randomizing patients as they go forward and, and they've got the mechanism to yep. rapidly do RCTs. Well, yeah, and, I, and, oh no, I was just gonna say, I agree with what Jeff said. This is huge for the American College of Cardiology and can serve as a template for all sorts of randomized clinical trials in the future. Because, because in this particular trial, Sunu Rao, who did an exquisite job presenting it, they knew who were the radial sites, right? Because they already had a database. They knew about the clinical sites. They right. knew their history. So, so in this study, where you have to have some proficiency for radial access, they knew exactly which sites they would be able to include because those patients, those sites already demonstrated proficiency in, in radial catheterization. So I, I think it's a construct that I think is going to move forward uh, as, as a clinical trial mechanism. Yeah, and five million is a bargain for a clinical trial. Yeah, five million <laughs> is, uh, is nothing uh, as things go. Now, uh, tell me, Deepak, what about the Euro Euromax trial? That was another one that got a lot of play. Right, it did, and it was published simultaneously in New England Journal of Medicine. So that was a trial of bivalrudin versus heparin and optional 2B3 inhibitor in patients with ST segment elevation MI destined for primary PCI. Therapy was actually started in the ambulance but uh, it was really meant to address the same question that Horizons asked, Horizons AMI, some years back, but whether in the contemporary era, where a lot of places are doing radial approach, for example, the bleeding benefits of bivalrudin seen in Horizons AMI would persist. And from a bottom line perspective, yes, it did. So despite the fact that half the patients in Euromax got a radial approach, about half got prazigrel and ticaglor, more modern pharmacotherapy than clopidogrel, the bleeding benefit of bivalrudin still was there compared with heparin plus optional 2B3, which meant that about half got 2B3 inhibitors in the cath lab uh, as plant therapy and about a, another quarter got it as bailout therapy. So it largely confirms the reduction in bleeding that was seen in Horizons AMI, but extends it even to maybe sites or folks who were skeptical and said, oh, well, with a radial approach, it's going to decrease bleeding, bivalrudin you know, wouldn't help. Uh, it did seem to help. On the flip side, it also confirmed something that was seen in Horizons AMI, which was an increase in acute stent thrombosis in the bivalrudin arm versus a heparin plus 2B3A arm. So that, again, is a consistent finding. One difference between the two trials was that Horizons AMI did find a lower mortality, with a, a significant p-value in favor of bivalrudin that wasn't seen 
in this trial, you're a match. In a very, very, very small number of events. That's correct. Yeah, so hypothesis generating. I guess one of the issues uh, uh, that we talked about before was that a lot of the bivalrutin was given in the ambulance, and that's not a, a system that we've used very much in the United mm. States. And I think it's amazing. I mean, I think it's amazing <laughs> that when you have your STEMI, and you're at home in Europe, that the first per person who comes to see you is actually diagnosing you and treating you before you even hop into the ambulance. In the meantime, it looked to be about 60 minutes or so by the time that they were first medical contact in the lab, but very, very fast. And right. all the drugs were given up front, right, before angiography. So, look, I, I think that this is a very, very, uh, it's a call to arms for U U.S. healthcare systems. Now we get EKGs in the Boston area from the ambulances, and so right. we activate the cath lab based on the EKG reading by the ambulance attendants, the EMTs, and we activate the cath lab based on that, and so that shortening time, but to then perform a randomized trial that starts at the EMT, I, I think that's pretty Yeah, amazing. it's pretty impressive, but I, I would say you know that aspect of the trial wasn't randomized, so it wasn't randomizing whether treatment in the right. ambulance is better than not doing it, so I don't think we are uh, mandated in the U.S. to switch to that sort of broad type of uh, therapy, pharmacotherapy in the ambulance. And it'd be a little tougher in the U.S. too because depending on the country in Europe, some of the folks that are in those ambulances are really very well trained. Yeah, yeah. yeah and the distances traveled are typically uh, less. And I know from our own experience at UC San Diego, uh, when the interventionalists used to take the first call, uh, uh, in, in about 10%, 10, 15% of the cases, they come in and the patient, in fact, was not a candidate for emergent PCI. Right. So uh, we will have to uh, develop the systems not only to give the medications, but to ensure that they're given to the yeah. right people. But as you say, a, a call to arms, if you, can, uh, if you can get a marked reduction in adverse events by initiating therapy in the ambulance, uh, something that we need to pursue. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, uh, there was, of course, the uh, core valve experience. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we know that TAVR is one of the hottest topics uh, in our session yesterday on the highlights of Jack Journals. Turned out that uh, it composite, all the Jack Journals published nearly 50 manuscripts oh, wow. on, wow. on TAVR wow. last year. Wow. Uh, wow. Uh, the interventions had one, in, one entire uh, focus issue. And so uh, some, some new data on the core valve in patients who are extreme risk for right. surgical right. procedures. So we, we did, and of course, uh, just as a bit of background, the commercial available sapien device is a balloon expandable valve with a bovine pericardial um, uh, leaflets and the, uh, the core valve is a self-expanding nitinol frame that has porcine pericardial leaflets to it, so a little bit different in terms of its structure. And so we studied uh, 487 patients that were deemed by two heart surgeons at the clinical sites and confirmed by two heart surgeons on the screening committee to be really at extreme risk for an operation, more harm than good. And what we found in this you know, very comorbid and frail and disabled population uh, was that the, um, the one-year all-cost mortality and major stroke rate was 25.5%, and that beat the performance goal of 43% and highly significant. We also found that there were relatively reassuring low stroke rates, 2.4% at, at 30 days and 4.1% at a year, and that the fear of paravalvular regurgitation was actually well-treated, I think, because of how we screen the patients for the valve sizing, 11% moderate uh, paravalvular leak at, at, um, at one month that reduced to 4.1% at, at one year. So all in all, an extreme risk population, another therapy to supplement the currently commercially available therapy with Sapien for these extreme risk patients. Yeah, no, no question that TAVR is here to stay, uh, right. uh, certainly for the patients who have no uh, uh, surgical alternatives. There was another trial on, on yet another uh, 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 aortic valve prosthesis for percutaneous implantation. There's a number of them under development, yes. so that field is going to explode. And it's well, good to see that the stroke rates are 
if anything, coming down. Coming down. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think part of that's patient selection. We, we, we understand who we should be doing this procedure in, but I think part of it is the reduction in the size of the catheters that we're progressively sure. seeing over time. So putting very large sheets and very large catheter sizes in that are being reduced. And, I think and, that's and the scale of the operators too, as more and yeah. more studies are done. Well, lots more to discuss. Stay with us. We'll be right back.